All right, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, my name is Brittany Carroll Hatcher. I'm a case coordinator with Lutheran Family Services, Rocky Mountains, and I'm here with Matthew Graham. I'll let him introduce himself here in a second. Uh, we work in the Refugee and Asylee Program. Um, so we're working with refugees and some other statuses that are eligible for programs um, to welcome them to Colorado Springs and help them adjust to living here um, and into help with integration and on um, the path to self-sufficiency. So as a case coordinator, I oversee and supervise direct services, and I also manage volunteer and community engagement. I've been with LFSRM for six years now, and um, I'll kind of jump more into our program, but I'll let Matt introduce himself. My name is Matt Cram. I'm the resettlement aide at Lutheran Family Services. Uh, the main areas that I oversee are welcome and disorientations for new arrivals, um, as well as housing, orchestrating moves for new arrivals and finding housing for them. Okay, so um, Lutheran Family Services is affiliated with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, um, which is an agency that's contracted with the State Department to resettle refugees through a federal program. So we welcome refugees here to Colorado Springs. Um, we're able to serve several different statuses um, and we often refer to them as um, Office of Refugee Resettlement Eligible Statuses. They're groups that are eligible for federal refugee programming. And so we work with people, refugees, as I've been mentioning, these are individuals who have been persecuted based on race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. And they've crossed outside of their country of origin and are unable to return to that country um, for fear for their safety. And so the U.S. government processes refugees overseas. It's a very complex um, vetting process where refugees undergo several security screenings through various different agencies and um, and uh, undergo interviews, health screenings, cultural orientation trainings prior to coming to the U.S. We also work with asylees and these are individuals who have been granted asylum through U.S. immigration courts. They're often they're screened on the same definition of refugees. The primary difference is that they've been um, processed and applied for asylum while they're within the country, whereas refugees are vetted overseas and enter into the country with refugee status. We can also serve special immigrant visa holders. These are individuals who worked with the military or other governmental organizations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so you're hearing a lot about special immigrant visa holders in the news. These are many of the people who are being evacuated out of Afghanistan right now, people who are within or undergoing that process, that screening process. Um, we can serve people, I guess, Cuban and Haitian entrants. And so these are individuals with various statuses from Cuba and Haiti. And we also serve international victims of trafficking. So um, that's, a little bit about who we serve, and I'll, um, I guess, pass it over here to Matt in just a moment um, so we can share more about how Ascension um, is supporting our programming. The refugee program really is in a time of rebuilding. The current um, presidential determination, which is a ceiling or a cap of refugees for each fiscal year, um, is currently set at 62,500. And this is an increase from 15,000 where it was set previously. Um, and so we're really working in our office to build capacity to be welcoming more refugees here in Colorado Springs. And as I'm sure you've all heard in the news, we're also expecting many refugees to be arriving from Afghanistan. And these are people who are being evacuated um, Many of them were in the process of obtaining special immigrant visas um, due to their service with the military as interpreters um, or work in embassies or other with other US agencies. And um, others you know, who are being evacuated might be women's rights activists um, and other groups that worked, worked to support um, the US. And so we're anticipating that we will be serving Afghan refugees here in Colorado Springs. 
Um, and so we're also working to build up capacity and community support to work with, with those who arrive from Afghanistan. So uh, the support from, from Ascension really has helped us to fund Matt's position um, to focus on things like health and case management. These are um, positions that were cut down when refugee numbers were decreased. And so having somebody on staff now to help us prepare um, and work with those who are coming has been really, really invaluable. So I'll let Matt share a little bit more about what he's been working on, and then I will move on to sharing more about our response to um, Afghan refugees. Yeah, I'd really like to start by thanking you guys for your guys' support. It came at a really critical time when the vaccination rollouts came through. Uh, one of my first tasks I was able to do is really reach out to our populations, educate them about the vaccine, tell them how to get the vaccine. Uh, as many of our populations are in, in that area that often are overlooked due to language barriers, due to um, discrimination barriers. And so that was a really important first step I was able to accomplish um, in this position. Uh, since then, I've also taken over housing, helping to build capacity for housing, as you all know. We're in a bit of a housing crunch here in Colorado Springs. And so I've been working with apartment complexes, trying to get partnerships with them, which is also proving to be very critical right now as we do uh, expect an influx of Afghans coming in. We're going to have to find apartments and places for them to live. And that work really made uh, our office's preparation uh, for this time. Um, without it, I don't know where the office would have been able to be without someone being able to build that support for housing. Um, in addition to that, I also do health and wellness. And so with our new arrivals, we go over an orientation, making sure proper cleaning, proper uh, hygiene, all of that kind of towards uh, the standards that we expect um, that we may not always uh, associate needing to teach others. Obviously, when individuals are coming out of refugee camps, um, their method of uh, handling raw meat, for example, uh, is very different from what we have. Um, in addition to that, um, kind of attached to my role in housing. I also orchestrate moves. And so I make sure all of our new arrivals have furniture. It goes into the apartments. We get the furniture moved in. So when new arrivals come, they don't have to worry about where they're going to live. They don't have to worry about where the furniture is coming from. That's my job to make sure that that process goes smoothly. That's large. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to second Matt's thank you, um, because really the capacity that we've been able to build um, with your support has really, really made a difference. Um, and, you know, I'll jump into speaking about the current crisis in Afghanistan now, because it's even more important that we have Matt on board helping us to be preparing for more arrivals, um, because we are um, expecting to serve several families from Afghanistan here in Colorado Springs. And um, things are changing daily, so I don't yet have specific numbers that I can share or a set time frame, but we, um, we're, we're hearing that many people are going to arrive with a new status, and the status is going to be humanitarian parole. And so this is just due to the speed of the evacuation. And so, um, you know, trying to help people get out quickly and help them come here to safety quickly. They're going to be getting a status that would not make them eligible for traditional refugee programming. And so what that means is that we are going to be relying more on community support to help make sure that these families are able to um, support themselves and adjust quickly um, because they will not be getting some of this long-term support that refugees do receive. So, um, what we're looking for now is for um, several different ways, I guess, of support. So the first is financial contributions. Financial support really allows us to be the most flexible in meeting the needs of these families when they do start to arrive. Um, so we expect to use um, financial contributions to pay for things like extended rent, to pay for um, to pay for medical expenses, um, cover covering food, purchasing clothing, things things of that nature. Um, there will be some short-term support for Afghan refugees when they do arrive. What we're hearing is that it's likely to be around three months of support. Um, 
they will be waiting on their work authorization um, to be approved. And so they'll be applying for that prior to coming to Colorado Springs, but sometimes those processes take longer than three months. So, um, so the financial contributions will really help those people to kind of bridge that gap between when they're able to start working um, and when that initial financial assistance runs out. Um, in addition, um, we are always looking for volunteers. We have several families um, coming from across across the world um, in this next week, actually. We have families from Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, families from Central America, and um, we just welcomed, I guess, families from Burma as well. So um, we are looking for volunteers to serve on cultural mentor teams. And these teams are usually four to six volunteers and volunteers help support the family alongside the office with learning about life in Colorado Springs. So um, it's really great for teams to maybe take them to see Garden of the Gods or um, show them you know, ways that they can maybe purchase items on a budget. So taking them to thrift stores or to the dollar store, um, helping them with budgeting, um, learning about US currency, um, you know, Every individual family will have individual needs, and so that will be explained, but, um, but these are some of the things that the teams help with. So for volunteer teams, we usually ask for a six-month commitment, and we ask that each individual on the team spend approximately four hours a month with the family. But the goal really is that the team will um, work together to support the family. So. Um, you know, if one person isn't available for a set amount of time, other team members might be able to step in. Um, we do hold volunteer trainings. Um, we hold them on the first Tuesday of each month, and you can register for them online. Um, and in the trainings, we go through more information about our program, the process that refugees undergo to come to the United States, um, the ways that our office provides support, we talk through um, ways that volunteer teams can provide support and then sort of go through volunteer, I guess, expectations of volunteers as well. So, so that's another way that you can get involved to support refugees that are coming as well as um, future Afghan refugees that we do anticipate we'll see. And um, finally, I guess, as we're looking to support these Afghan refugees who will be coming with humanitarian parole, we are looking for more co-sponsorships. And so this will, um, we're still working out the logistics of how this will work, but um, it would be a larger group around a family that would provide um, additional supports, um, financial contributions, help covering things like rent, um, as well as supports that we would see through a cultural mentor team. So. Um, so those are some ways that you can get involved. Um, Matt, I guess I'll let him jump in to share our donation needs. We do furnish apartments for families when they arrive. And so we often have items that we need um, donated to, um, to, um, to put in the apartments. So I'll let Matt jump in here to share more about our donation needs. Just to give you guys an idea of uh, the donations that we do accept, uh, furniture-wise, it's really just the bare minimum in an apartment, such as a couch, a bed, a table, dishes, linens, things of that nature. Um, at the end of this week, uh, due to the many arrivals we're actually getting this week, we're probably going to have to restock almost all of our supplies. Um, with that being said, if anyone has any dressers that they want to part with today, <laughs> if you can let me know, <laughs> it would be greatly appreciated. Um, but the, the, um, the furniture items that we always run out of very quickly are beds and obviously right now dressers. Uh, but by the end of this week, I think we're going to have to about restock on all the furniture needs that we have. Um, so yes, uh, concerning beds, we don't take king size beds. We stick with queens, fulls, and singles. And obviously singles go very quickly because often we have really large families and you need to get a single bed to each of the children and then you know one group with no more single beds on. So <laughs> those are really our donation needs. Um, yeah and I'd also like to put a little caveat on housing. If anyone knows anyone who runs an apartment complex 
if you know maybe we could connect after this as that's a really critical um, issue right now with the lack of housing and making sure that we have the capacity to welcome new arrivals into our community. Thank you, Doug. Um, Matt, could you just talk about who do we call the, uh, you know, if we have a bed or know of a bed or, you know, uh -huh. how does that work? How does the process work to get you stuff? Yeah, so you can call my number, which I can actually leave my number here. Um, and it'll come to me and I'll be able to call back and just say, hi, this is such and such. I've got a, say it's a bed donation. I've got a single bed, single mattress. Uh, you give me a call back, I'll call you back and I'll make sure that I can set up a time to pick this up from your house and go from there. But the best way to contact me would be through calling me on my office phone, or I can also leave my email if you'd like to shoot me an email. Yeah, yeah. So if you could like give us an email, we can post that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do just want to add that we accept either new donations or also gently used um, in good condition. Um, so um, we do take mattresses um, as well for the beds. But um, our, I just want to add another piece. We are, I think, emptying out our storage. So we should have space for donated items, but we do have a pretty small storage facility. So um, it's possible if it's in a few weeks, it could be full again um, until we have more families arriving and we need to move that furniture out. So occasionally, um, just depending on the time frame, we might not be able to accept the donations if we just don't have the space. So and which, that also becomes critical if, if you have a donation that you can hold on to for a couple of weeks because it really has to be targeted due to the art shortage of space. But we're <laughs> going to need it. So if it's something you're able to hold on to, that'll be important. Also want to add, if there's furniture, we stay with the glass and glass and paper. <laughs> Um, I can give you the, my phone number, my email right now, or actually, make sure we get it so we can post it. Well, I think it's the, if it just puts down the stamp where they post it on the uh, Zoom link. Oh, so there are two that do that sample. Yeah. yeah. Bring that to it. Yeah, I'm yeah. very happy. So that was a pretty brief overview. Does anyone have any questions? And we're happy to share more information. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, we do. With towels, sheets, pillows, all of that, all, everything that you can do on the bed, as long as it's in good, clean condition. Yes. Yes, I'm happy to repeat it. So the question was if there's any English language training. And so, yes, everybody is referred to English language training upon arrival. And so um, we partner with Colorado Springs School District 11 in the adult and family education program. They have ESL classes. And so all adults um, do um, get enrolled in ESL classes when they first arrive. Sometimes if people speak English, they test out of those classes and are not expected to attend. And then for children, we have a school programs coordinator who works directly in the schools and she provides um, tutoring support for students who need it. And then she also works to help make sure that the students are connected also with district um, ESL resources. Could you provide a list of things that Yes, thank you so much. Um, yes, we do have a list, and so we'll make sure that we get that to you. Yeah, so the question was about how many families we are supporting currently in Colorado Springs and then how long we're able to support them. Um, and so right now we're supporting between 100 to 150 cases. Um, I don't know, do you know the exact number? Okay. Um, and, and so a case could be a family or it could be an individual um, who is on their own case. So um, 
those are people who are currently receiving services. We're able to work with people for up to five years from when they first become eligible for services. So for many, that's when they first arrive in the country. Um, and so I would say several of the many, I would say the majority of those cases that are currently being served are new. However, we did see an influx in people needing support during the pandemic. And so there are several cases that have been reopened for additional support um, since when the pandemic first hit, many people needed support when they were um, initially out of work. Um, we are expecting that um, we'll, we'll be serving around 175 refugees in this coming federal fiscal year, which will start October 1. And so, um, and so that will be individuals, um, not families. So um, we'll, we'll see if that's um, the number we get to, and then we'll likely be serving additional Afghan refugees on top of that. But like I said, for that number, we really don't have a set number yet. Yes. Some particular issues that will come up with the teams that we train. What are some common uh, issues that the families struggle with? Yes, I can share some common issues that teams might see when they're supporting refugee families. Um, and so let me think where to start. Um, a really common one we see is just learning um, about living in an apartment. And so we're seeing a lot of families coming from refugee camps. The average time families spend in refugee camps is 17 years. And so people have been there a really long time. Often if they're coming with small children, the children were born in refugee camps and may have never been to their their family's country of origin. So um, that being said, coming from a camp and learning to live in an apartment in Colorado Springs is a big adjustment. And so teams often provide support around just helping make sure they're, they're keeping the apartment maintained, keeping it clean, following food safety. Um, that's some of the work that Matt's been doing, um, providing additional orientations so that people um, just have the support and knowledge to to um, get used to, to living to living here. Um, another challenge is, or I guess not, I guess the challenge or barrier is just financial. And so I think teams often can support around budgeting. And so when families first come, there is some limited financial support for them, but typically the support ends after three months and um, while there are some longer term supports, they don't necessarily cover the rent. So on average, most families are working within three months after they arrive um, so that they're able to cover their expenses. And so um, really helping people to budget um, and just be smart with their financial decisions is important as well, because as you can imagine, if people are coming from camps, they don't know a lot about our financial systems um, and just budgeting is a foreign concept because there really was nothing to be budgeting with previously. So, um, so that's another area where teams often provide support. And um, I, think, I guess, you know, alongside that, it, it's another thing could be um, just learning how to navigate systems here. And so, um, for example, we have a new family that just arrived that has a lot of medical needs. And so an area where their team is supporting them is really helping them to manage the medical appointments um, because there's a lot of specialists involved, um, different medications involved and just learning how to navigate those systems. Um, and I think that's something that we see, whether it's maybe with medical support, learning, helping them to learn to navigate um, you know, other systems as well. Schools, you know, um, can be challenging to navigate. And I want to add that we have staff that also provide education and support around this, but teams really can often um, provide backup support in those areas. Yes. Another related question. Creating um, a healthy space and boundaries 
Yes, thank you for asking that question. Yes, so um, the question was around uh, having boundaries with when you're working on a cultural mentor team, having boundaries with the family you're working with. And so the two examples given were maybe sharing a meal or maybe providing financial support, loaning $50. Um, and so this is something that we talk about extensively in our volunteer training because we do um, expect that volunteer teams teams maintain um, boundaries with, with the families they're supporting. And so um, I guess we, we often just use the caveat that this family is not your family. So please don't treat them like family. We, we want volunteers to really be, um, be providing support and to be um, empowering families to become self-sufficient. And so that's really our goal as staff and as volunteers to really help help with teaching rather than doing things for the family. So um, a common example along that lines is a lot of families have anxiety around, around taking the bus when they first get here. And it, I think is common for maybe volunteers to also feel concerned because maybe they're not as familiar with the bus system as well. Um, but our goal really is for us to be supporting and helping them to learn to use the bus rather than maybe approaching the situation as, oh, um, this person is, is new, they don't speak the language, they're afraid to take the bus, I'm just gonna drive them everywhere they need to go. Because when that happens, then they never learn to use the bus and they're relying on that volunteer. And so um, we wanna avoid situations like that. The example of sharing a meal, a meal is encouraged. Um, we do want the family, the teams to be a source of friendship and support for the families, help them learning to learn about US culture. Um, so sharing a meal is fine, um, but we do request that there's no financial exchange directly from the volunteer team to the family. Um, and that just kind of ties back to, we don't want the families to be relying on the volunteers for things that they need. Um, um. I have a question from online. Does, sure. Can or does LFS try to settle refugees in smaller communities or towns? Would that be easier for non-natives to the US to adjust to a very different culture? Seems a big city with housing and transportation challenges would make things more difficult. Yeah. So the question was if we ever tried to resettle refugees in smaller communities. And so um, for us, we're primarily working within Colorado Springs. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, our office is here. We need to rely on, on things like public transportation. And so in smaller communities, there may not be as robust of a public transportation system. Um, and we're, we're working, um, we've been in working in the Colorado Springs community for several decades, developing relationships with employers and with apartment complexes. And so, we, even though there are challenges to finding jobs and to finding apartments, we have a network of support already here. Um, so that is a good question, but typically, um, typically agencies are already set up to serve in one specific city, so. Yes. Is it appropriate for the uh, church like yeah, so the question was if it's appropriate for a team um, through a church to um, invite the refugees to come to a church service with them. Um, and so the answer is it's um, a little tricky with that. So Lutheran Family Services um, is non-proselytizing, and so we do ask that, that volunteers refrain from proselytizing as well. We wanna be really 
respectful and mindful that refugees may have been persecuted based on their religion. And so we really ask that volunteer teams refrain from inviting their families to church with them um, because we just don't know how the family will react to that invitation. And we want to make sure they feel safe receiving services from us. Um, that being said, sometimes um, families do request um, or ask to go. And if it's really an ask from the family, then, then that's a different situation. Um, but we do work um, when families first arrive to make sure that they're connected with their faith community. So, um, so often we're able to connect them with, with um, a local church or a local mosque, um, you know, or whichever organization they're part of. Yes. Yeah, so the question is if refugee families are clustered together in um, maybe the same apartments or the same employers. Um, and so the answer is a little bit of yes and no. Um, we do have apartment complexes that maybe have several refugee families. I do think um, in Colorado Springs, we tend to see people being more spread out rather all in one specific pocket of the, of the city. And so um, part of that is because we're a smaller program. And so we've always worked with a lot of different apartments and a lot of different employers rather than having everybody all in one location. Yes. Yeah, okay, so that question was if we've ever had to support refugees um, in the legal system, maybe due to harassment, um, just due to the political nature um, of immigration right now. And so the, I guess I haven't, I haven't seen any families that have been specifically targeted um, and had a crime committed against them by anyone. I think despite the political climate, Colorado Springs has been a really welcoming community and we've seen a lot of support from, from community members welcoming refugees here to Colorado. So fortunately, we really haven't had that situation come up. Um, so I, if it were to come up, we would look at ways that we could provide provide support for them, but but fortunately we really haven't we really haven't seen that. And um, I guess on that note, we do have quarterly meetings that we hold with local partners, um, including um, a representative from the Colorado Springs Police Department. And so if there ever were to be an uptick in crimes being committed against against immigrants, I think we would be able to address it um, in those meetings. Okay, so that question was, um, since refugees aren't all living together, how are they able to form bonds with others in the community um, so that they're not isolated? And so um, we, we, we do try to um, place families in apartment complexes um, where there might be other members of their community. So Matt does take that into consideration when he's looking for apartments for new families. Um, or if we have new families arriving, um, like we do this week, we might try to place them all in the same apartment um, so they're able to be a support to each other. Um, so that is something we try to, we try to do even though even though people are spread out, there might be a few families in one location and a few families in another. Um, we also um, will connect people to others. So if 
maybe a single person from Democratic of the Congo arrives and they don't know anyone here, we'll introduce them to a few other refugees that have arrived recently so that they um, can meet each other and provide support. Outside of that, I would say people also meet at English classes that they all attend or other programs. And so, so they're able to, to meet each other and, and um, bond in that way. Are there any other questions? Yes. So, you know, we've been supporting LRS. Sometimes it feels like um, to, to get information, we kind of have to go and ask it from you. Do you have ways you're, you're pumping out information that uh, so we can keep on top of what's going on uh, that Katie were missing? Yeah. So the question was if we have ways that we can share out information on what's happening. And so we do have newsletters that go out. Um, I know there's a Colorado Springs newsletter that is sent out. Um, and I also sometimes will share updates. And so um, I'm happy to make sure that that we get updates to you so that you're not having to come to us to ask for, for information or updates on our program. You mentioned that uh some arrivals would be on special humanitarian and non-official refugee status. Is there any significant difference on how they're treated or what their long-term prospects are? Yeah, so um, the main the main difference is that I guess there's a few a couple main differences. And so the first is that those who are entering with humanitarian parole will be work authorized, but they won't be work authorized immediately upon arrival. Um, so when refugees come, um, they're work authorized from the day they enter the country. So they have a, a admission stamp when they enter the country saying that they're able to work. So if they wanted to and had a job, they could start the day they get here in Colorado Springs. Um, and so those entering with humanitarian parole while they will be approved for work authorization, they're gonna have to wait for it to be to go through the process. So, so that's one, one challenge and difference. And then the second is that they're not gonna be eligible for, for refugee, for longer term refugee services. And so refugee resettlement really is set up with two pillars we kind of say. And so one pillar is the State Department and they fund a program called Reception and Placement that funds the first 90 days that they arrive in the country. And so this is money that we use to set up an apartment for them when they first arrive, we purchase initial food for them um, and it helps them for the first 90 days. After that program ends and that, or that money has run out, there's a second pillar um, that's funded through the Office of Refugee Resettlement and that's within the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. And this, these programs can support people for, for longer periods of time. So there might be other programs that can provide some financial support for maybe six months, eight months, sometimes longer. Um, and so with those entering with humanitarian parole are gonna have a similar program to that reception and placement program for the first 90 days, but they don't have eligibility for a longer term program past that. And so I think that's where we're gonna see challenges because they're also not gonna have their work authorization. And so, and so we're gonna have to see when, when the work authorization will arrive. Um, it's hard to say right now. I know they're gonna try to expedite that, that authorization, but you know, sometimes if it arrives in month four um, and they still have to get a job you know, and wait for paychecks to be able to support themselves, I think there's gonna be a gap where, where they're not gonna be eligible for you know, for other forms of assistance and are gonna need that support to cover things like rent um, or cover things like food. Um, another important thing to note is that with humanitarian parole, they're also not gonna be eligible for things like public benefits. Um, and so for refugees, they're eligible for public benefits. Um, there's also refugee specific things like a refugee medical assistance program that can cover medical expenses, but um, so we're still looking into and trying to figure out how those systems are going to look like for those entering with humanitarian parole, but it's possible that they won't have things like medical insurance or things like, um, like food supports to fall back on if, um, if they're kind of within that period 
waiting for work authorization after that initial program ends. Yes, I can. So um, we're with Lutheran Family Services, Rocky Mountains, and we're an affiliate of Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service for LIRS. Um, and so LIRS is, um, we often call them our national agency. And so in refugee resettlement, there's nine um, voluntary agencies that contract with the State Department. Um, and LIRS is one of those agencies um, to provide and so the contract is to provide this reception and placement program um, that funds services for the first 90 days. And so, so um, LIRS has affiliates across, across the country. And so Lutheran Family Services, Rocky Mountains is one of those affiliates. Um, and similarly, other um, Lutheran agencies in other states or other regions that support refugees are, are other affiliate agencies. So, um, so I guess we're doing work more locally, whereas LIRS is more working on a, the national level and overseeing um, those affiliates across the nation. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, just to, like, it's been in the papers and things, and one of the first ones often mentioned is that Lutheran Family Services or LRS in terms of refugee resettlement. I get the sense it's a pretty big organization nationally and percentage wise of refugees. Can you say something about that? Yes, I can. So uh, the question was just about how large LRS is, since they're um, seen often quoted in the media regarding um, everything that's going on with the crisis in Afghanistan. And so I don't know the specific numbers around it, but I know historically LIRS has been around the second or third largest um, resettlement or voluntary agency um, in the country. And so uh, out of the nine, we're, we're kind of up there in the top three, I would say. Another question. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you. 